persuasive web design and copywriting series, and has led BKI Studio's usability and conversion optimization products for over, sorry, projects for over five years. He also teaches BKI's copywriting and online persuasion courses, which I suppose I should have said are cardinal tasks, copywriting and online persuasion courses now. For those of us, or rather for those of you who haven't joined us before, if you have a question, please ask us in the questions pane in the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, at the end of the Q and A, or sorry, at the end of the webinar, during our Q and A period, I will ask questions to Michael, and he'll answer as well as he can. Also, if you're having any audio trouble, I recommend that you join us using telephone audio. Although I suppose you wouldn't be able to hear me if that were the case. Just call the number listed in the audio panel, enter your access code. And when asked for an audio pin, just press the pound or hash symbol. So Michael, I think I'm going to hand this over to you. Thank you, Kent. This is Michael Straker. I'm with uh, the User Experience Group here at Cardinal Path. In my last webinar, I dealt with social proof. And that was about how, uh, in a given so situation, we view behavior as correct to the extent that we see other people do it. And we, that sounds very straightforward, but as we saw last time, uh, there were some very surprising and some, sometimes downright illogical ramifications. Well, today I'm going to discuss the contrast principle and decidophobia, which is decision paralysis. And as with social proof, on the surface it all sounds very simple and obvious, but we'll see how it leads to some very strange and surprising results. So let's get started. The basic not surprising and uh, totally logical point is that in evaluating products, we contrast them with other products. And this uh, applies to all product attributes, whether it's cost or value of something, how big it looks, how it tastes, uh, the attractiveness of things. We, we compare them to other products. We don't evaluate them in a vacuum. We have such a strong need to draw comparisons that we find it very difficult to evaluate products in a vacuum. And this is important. We will resist doing to doing so. If we're forced into a situation where we uh, have to evaluate in a vacuum, it's, it's very uncomfortable. We need comparisons. Let's take a real simple example. Say you're shopping for an outboard motor, and you see that a 20 horsepower motor is $1,900. Is that a good deal? Well, it's, it's really hard to say, isn't it? You, you, don't, you have nothing to compare it with. So if you add in some comparisons, and say a 10 horsepower motor is 1600, or 20 horsepower motor, there it is, 1900, and a 25 horsepower motor is $2,700. And now we ask, is that 20 horsepower motor a good deal? Well, you bet it is. You know, it's, it's twice the power of the 10, and yet only slightly more expensive. And it's darn near as powerful as the 25, yet way less. So all of a sudden, it looks like a really good deal. Well, this is exactly the kind of situation that happened with Williams-Sonoma when they introduced the bread bakery home baking system, a, a bread baking machine. When they launched, they had just one model, and they priced it at $275. And guess what? Crickets. It didn't sell. Customers just couldn't decide if it was a good deal. They didn't understand it. They had nothing to compare it with. So let me ask, what do you do when you have an innovative product that just isn't selling? Do you, do you lower the price to make it more attractive? Do you raise the price on the assumption that people assume if it's more expensive, it must be good? Well, arguably, you could do either. But if you lower the price, not only are you reducing your profits, and you could cheapen its perceived value. If you raise the price, you just might scare people off. What did the clever folks at Williams-Sonoma do? <laughs> well, they expanded the product line. They recognized that the problem wasn't the price point per se, it's that customers didn't know if it's a good deal. So they introduced a larger model, and they priced it at about 50% more. And now, as you see, this bigger machine at $420, and our original machine at $275, suddenly this $275 machine looks like a good deal. It does everything the bigger machine does, it's a, it's a more compact machine, and yet it costs far less. Now this expensive unit was really just a decoy. The makers didn't really expect to sell many of them, but that wasn't the point. Its purpose was to make our original machine look good, and it worked. Customers could now be confident that they're making a smart choice, and sales exploded. So the takeaway is 
don't price your products in a vacuum. If you have just one product or say one product in a given category, add others so that your customers can compare. Even if these other ones that you add are just decoys and you don't really expect to sell them, we don't want to evaluate products in a vacuum. We need a comparison, so add comparisons. So far, everything still sounds very rational, but let's move on to the fun stuff. Let's see just how irrational we can be. Dan Ariely, who's a professor at Duke University, did this study, and he describes it in his great book, Predictably Irrational. Uh, he also supplied the, the bread bakery example. Now, at the end of the webinar, I'll be putting together a, uh, I'll be going through a reading list of recommended reading, so you don't have to write down this stuff now. But this is from Predictably Irrational, and it's a great book. Dan and his team, they created two male characters, Tom and Jerry, and they designed them to be equally attractive. And they would ask women, well, which one do you want to date? And they were found, indeed, to be equally attractive. Then what they did, they created ugly versions of each of these characters. They kind of broke their noses and twisted their faces and made them look asymmetrical. He called them Tom Prime and Jerry Prime. I call them Ugly Tom and Ugly Jerry. So that's what, I'm, you know, that's what I've always called them, so that's what I'm going to call them. So he created ugly versions. And then we do a fresh comparison. Tom is now presented beside Ugly Jerry and Jerry. And now women are asked, who do you want to date? Well, suddenly, even though Jerry and Tom were equal before, suddenly Jerry is much more attractive. Jerry wins now. He's seen not only more, as more attractive than Ugly Jerry, but more attractive than Tom. They were formerly equals, and now Jerry is suddenly superior. Why? Because we need comparisons. But here's the catch. The comparisons have to be easy. It's easier to compare Jerry with Ugly Jerry than it is with Tom, so that's what we do. We compare him with Jerry, and Ugly Jerry comes up short, but Jerry looks great. But here's the great thing. Not only does he look better than Ugly Jerry, he looks better than Tom. It's sort of a halo effect. Before they're equal, but when placed beside an ugly version of himself, he looks not only better than the ugly version, but better than Tom. And if you're wondering, yes, the reverse is also true. When Tom was presented against Tom, or sorry, Tom was presented against Ugly Tom and Jerry, well, guess what? Tom is suddenly not only more attractive than Ugly Tom, but he's more attractive than Jerry. It's not strictly rational, but it works. At last you think this only applies to sort of trivial matters or college students in a hypothetical kind of who'd you like to date scenario, let's look at a real world example in a somewhat more uh, upscaled upscale and targeted, uh, edu sorry, educated target market. Let's look at The Economist magazine and how many people might choose the types of subscriptions they want, hard copy, uh, online edition, etc. Now, this is a real world example, but how it went down is a little complicated. So first, let me explain the experiment run by Dan Ariely and that he outlines in Predictably Irrational. He did a test, and he presented test subjects with two options and asked them which they would prefer. Would you prefer website only for $59 or print and web for $125? So before I move on to the findings, what would you choose? Think about it for a second. Website only for $59 or print and web for $125? Which way would you go? Well, if you're like the test subjects, over two-thirds picked website only. Only 32% uh, chose print and web. And no surprise, it's a website that's only half the price, and so in contrast, it looks good. But let's assume, let's assume that you really want to sell print and web. How do we make that option look more attractive without lowering any prices? Well, think back to the previous example of Ugly Jerry. If we want to sell print and web, what's the equivalent of an Ugly Jerry? Well, how about print only for $125, the same price as print and web? Well, that's nuts. Who would go for that? Nobody would pick that, so how could that possibly affect our decision, right? 
Well, let's see what happened. Remember that before we put in our ugly cherry, before we put in our decoy, 68% went for website only, and only 32% went for printed web, which is what we really want to sell. Well, let's see what the decoy did. Nobody took the decoy, but notice that web only, formerly 68%, is now down to 16%. And what we really want to sell, print and web, has now gone from 32% to 84%. Yet nothing had changed. Web only is still $59. Print and web is still $125. Nobody fell for the decoy, but suddenly print and web looks so much better. It's an ugly jerry. Well, I said it was a bit complicated uh, because, in fact, Dan Ariely's experiment came later. The Economist really did offer these deals online. You might ask, they had the ugly jerry. And you might ask, well, was it a typo? Was it a mistake? No. They knew exactly what they were doing. Print only is a decoy. They didn't expect anyone to take it. It's there for the sole purpose of making print and web, which is what they really want to sell, look good. Economist subscribers are not exactly lowbrow. This is aimed at a highly educated, very successful business executives, politicians, and the like. The average annual income of Economist subscribers is in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Very upscale. So the takeaway here is that Ugly Jerry, this decoy strategy, can work anywhere, even with the most sophisticated audiences. We are all prone to it. And the beauty of these decoy strategies, whether it's bread machines or magazines, is you don't have to lower your price to make your product look like a bargain. And let's just look at an online example. I found this just yesterday on Best Buy. These are our little grills, these little grills, grills, whatever you call them. Uh, here we have a Cuisinart one for $169. We have this really cool looking Breville one for $199. Oh, it's a little more money. It does the same thing. But then we have this other Breville one that looks really similar to the Breville, but it's twice the price at $3.99. Well, gee, suddenly this $1.99 Breville is looking a lot better, isn't it? it? It seems like it's a very similar machine, and yet it's half the price. It's only slightly more than the Cuisinart. So even though the, I might have been thinking the Cuisinart before, now that I see this, this $400 one, all of a sudden this $1.99 Breville is looking better. Whether it was intentional or not, it's an ugly jerry. So ask yourself if there's some way that Ugly Jerry can help you out. Uh, see if you can make your products more attractive without lowering their price. Think of potential decoy strategies for your website. Let's move on to the second part of this webinar, and this is uh, purchase paralysis, or as I call it, decidophobia. We tend to think that having lots of options is a good thing. We, you know, we love to have choice, but really making decisions is hard. And, and we want it to be easy. Having too much choices can make it tough to decide. And then, and then what happens? Well, let's take a look at a study from the year 2000, where the experimenters set up a jam tasting booth in upscale, rest, in upscale supermarkets. They had two types of booths. Some of them offered only a limited choice of jams, six. And some of the booths offered a very extensive choice of jams, 40 flavors. Observers were put in place to record how many passers-by approached the booth, how many flavors they, ta they tasted, and how many jars they bought. Let's see what happened. Well, the extensive choice, the one with 40 jams, it did draw more attention. 60% of passers-by approached the booth versus 40% for the limited choice booth. As for how many jams they sampled, well, you might think with 40 flavors to choose from, you'd, you'd sample more. There's, there's much more to sample. But really, it was almost a dead draw, an average of 1.4 versus 1.5 jams. So extensive choice drew people in, but it, they didn't really sample any more flavors. Of course, the most important question is, which led to more sales? Well, check it out. When given a choice of six flavors, 30% of people bought. So on the limited choice, 30% of people bought. When given a choice of 40 flavors, the extensive choice, that plummeted to 3%. Limited choice outperformed extensive choice by a factor of 10. 
Now, even if you factor in the fact that extensive choice drew more people in the first place, you still have way more people, about 12% purchasing from the limited choice versus about 1.8% from the extensive choice. Why, why is this? Well, 40 flavors, it's just too hard to decide. It's too hard to decide. So if, a decision, if it's a decision we don't have to make, we walk away. We don't have to have jam, so we leave. We have the choice to do nothing, and that's easy to do, so that's what we do. We walk away. It's just too hard to decide. So just bear in mind, you're not necessarily doing your customers or yourself a favor if you offer a really extensive selection. Some choice is great, but not too much. Well, you might ask, does this apply to important decisions? You know, buying jam is pretty trivial. Uh, it's just shoppers making an impulse purchase. Certainly this wouldn't apply to more serious decisions, would it? Well, let, let's look at a, a study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Doctors were presented with a scenario in which a patient suffered from osteoarthritis and were asked what treatment they would recommend. In one scenario, they had a choice of surgery or medication, which we'll call drug A. So surgery or medication, drug A, that's, that's the choice. In a second scenario, doctors were given an additional choice, surgery, drug A, which is the same drug we had before, or drug B, which is another common medication for osteoarthritis. Now, before we're looking at the results, let's ask, what should happen here? Logically, under which scenario should more doctors recommend surgery? Well, logically, it should be scenario A. You only have two choices, surgery or drug A. Under scenario B, doctors have an additional non-surgical option, drug B. So let's say for some reason that a particular doctor doesn't really like this drug A, he now has an, an extra option of choosing drug B. So you'd think that <laughs> fewer people that would choose surgery under, under B. Well, let's look to see what happened. With only one medication available, 28% 20 per, of doctors recommended surgery. But when they added the additional medication, 47% re recommended surgery. It almost doubled. Yet drug A is still an option. They could, still could have picked that. But just by adding this additional drug, this additional valid choice, drug B, almost double, twice as many people recommended surgery. It's, it's not logical. And, and similar results were observed with neurosurgeons regarding ar arterial surgery and even with legislators re regarding hospital closings. Adding additional choices just makes it harder to decide. So we'll either procrastinate, which wasn't an option here, or we'll go for the more distinctive option. We'll go for the more distinctive option, not one that's, that's hard, to, it's hard to decide between the two drugs. But the surgery is very distinctive, so it's easier to pick that one than it is to choose between the two drugs. We want our choices to be easy. So a decidive phobia affects all of us. It's not limited to uh, the average person in making a trivial decision. In this case, we're talking about doctors and legislators. So once again, if you think you're doing your customers a, a favor by offering lots of choice, you, you may be not. It, it, you may be better off offering fewer options. Make it easy for them to decide. We're approaching the end. I'd like to end with a, with a hypothetical, a sort of just for fun. Let's pretend you're in charge of selling drug A. Knowing what you know about the contrast principle, how could we persuade more doctors to recommend drug A? We have a choice of surgery or drug A. How do we persuade more people to, rec to more doctors to recommend drug A? Well, think about Ugly Jerry. What would an Ugly Jerry be here? Juggly, an Ugly Jerry would be something that's easily comparable to drug A. In other words, it would be a medication, but something that's clearly inferior. Vioxx, thalidomide, or something wholly inappropriate for treating osteoarthritis. So it's, it's, easy to, it's easy to dismiss because it's an 
easy comparison now between drug A and drug B. No way I want drug B. All of a sudden, drug A looks much more attractive. So again, this is a hypothetical. No one has done this study, but I'd love to see it done. And uh, I, I would bet my bottom dollar that that would actually work, and more doctors would be choosing drug A if you presented a really bad option. Because in, in, the, in the real study that was done, drug B was also a valid choice. And so the side of phobia kicked in. But if drug B is, is a good choice rather than a bad choice, then it's an ugly Jerry, and the ugly Jerry phenomenon kicks in. So that's, that's the end of the webinar. Uh, I'd like to close just with some uh, suggested reading. If, first of all, books. Uh, if you're just going to read one book on, on persuasion, the, the Bible is Robert, Robert Cialdini's Influence, the Psychology of Persuasion. It's just a fantastic book. It was written back in the 80s, but it, it doesn't matter. They, the principles are completely applicable today uh, and on the web. Another book that he co-authored is uh, Yes, 50 Scientifically Proven Ways to Be Persuasive. And this is a real easy read. It's 50 really short chapters. They're typically about three pages long each. So it's the kind of book you can just leave on your desk, and when you find yourself five minutes to kill, you can pick it up and read a chapter. And it, it's really fun stuff. So a lot of real counterintuitive things are in there. Then we have Dan Ariely's books, Predictably Irrational. It's just a fantastic book, The Hidden Forces That Shape Our Decisions. I highly recommend this book, and that's where a lot of these examples come from that we talked about today. He also has another book, The Upside of Irrationality, The Unexpected Benefits of Defying Logic at Work at Home. It's also really good. And Dr. Susan Weinshank has a book that's specifically about web, uh, neuro web design, what makes them click. That's good, too. Uh, blogs. Uh, try, out, try out Cyblog. It's really fun. A lot of persuasion stuff on there, and a lot of it's applicable to the web. Spring.org.uk. Then, of course, there's the VKS Studios blog at blog.vkstudios.com. And now, uh, cardinalpath.com uh, slash blog. So that's it. That's for today. My next uh, some webinar is going to be on the principle of reciprocation, which is how when someone does us a favor, we feel an irresistible impulse to give back. Uh, no date has been set for that yet, but stay tuned. It's coming soon. So thanks for joining me. I don't see any questions. So uh, until next time, ciao. All right, everyone. I actually am not seeing any questions. Does anyone have any questions to ask? All right. Thanks for coming out. And we hope that you'll come down and join us for our next webinar, which will be on Google Analytics. And until then, adieu.